My name is Scott Quire. I'm the Technical Director for Bluegrass Testing Laboratory, and I, uh, it's an extreme pleasure to be with you all here today. What we'd like to talk to uh, about the next several moments is the SuperPave aggregate properties and their influence on our, well, the things we're talking about this week in asphalt mixture performance. It has, when you think about, it represents 94 to 96 percent by mass of a product. It has a major and significant influence on the product we're trying to manufacture. At the advent of SuperPave, it was decided early on there are two uh, points of view on the aggregate properties that are critical to asphalt mixture performance. Those would be the source properties, and those would be the consensus aggregate properties. Uh, from the source properties, the three properties that typically that we're talking about predominantly across the country would be toughness, soundness, and deleterious materials. The consensus aggregate properties would be those that it, uh, through group agreement had uh, come to focus on the fact of things that are critical to mixed performance with uh, relative to aggregate properties would be coarse aggregate angularity, fine aggregate angularity, flat and elongated particles, and clay content. When we start talking about source properties, we're talking about the things predominantly that Mother Nature has blessed us with and those that are inherent to the materials themselves. So when we talk about those source properties, uh, for example, when we talk of toughness, we're talking about the Los Angeles abrasion test, ASHTO T96, and we see a maximum loss at 500 cycles, or 45% maximum. And what this predominantly is, it's a, uh, a graded sample. There are four different gradings of LA abrasion samples you can come up with, with a certain number of uh, ball bearing spheres placed in there. And during the course of this uh, test, there's 500 revolutions of a drum of a given graded material and there's an initial known sample mass and a final determined mass, that sample shaken over number 12 sieve. And then the difference between those two would tell you the percent loss of that original sample. It's a function of the test or the toughness of the materials and it's predominantly utilized just to give us an idea that during the course of construction and an asphalt mixture, how much degradation potential we should see with our aggregates. And there are limiting values on that. The other aggregate source property we'd like to talk about is soundness. And soundness relative to the normal solutions that are utilized in uh, sodium or sulfate soundness testing are, is either a sodium sulfate solution or a magnesium sulfate solution. Here in the state of Virginia, of course, we're using a magnesium sulfate solution. And what it is is the aggregate particles are prepared and as the test sample is placed into a solution and these aggregate particles are dry. They're placed into a solution, and during the course of this uh, uh, first immersion cycle, uh, the material is allowed to absorb the solution into its pores. At the conclusion of that first cycle, the material is taken out, it's dried to a constant mass, and then in turn it's reinserted back into this solution. And what happens is that upon reinsertion on the second cycle, the uh, previously dehydrated salt crystals rehydrate, creating an expansive force inside the aggregate that tends to degrade the material. Hence, it, it simulates freeze thaw conditions. And so we're using a sodium, well in this case, a magnesium sulfate soundness solution to simulate the freeze thaw cycles. And of the two solutions, the magnesium is a more aggressive and tougher test. And so in turn, it, it is uh, a pretty severe test relative to, to determining the degradation potential, the weathering of an aggregate. The other test that, that we talk about, of course, in, in deleterious materials is the determination of colon lignite and clay lumps. This next slide, we'd, uh, we would talk about that a little bit more. On coal and lignite, we're using ASHTO T113, and what that is, it's a solution that we made and prepared with a, a, a certain chemical. In this case, the, the predominant one that most people are utilizing across the country is zinc bromide. And it basically is, it's what we're basically taking a water from a specific gravity of 1.00 up to a solution specific gravity of 2.00. So with that sample prepared, then we take a prepared aggregate sample that's been soaked, taken out, uh, brought to a saturated surface dry condition, and then in turn that aggregate in that condition is introduced into this heavy media and tried, and you basically through the course of the testing, you're stirring the sample to see if any of the aggregate particles float. So if they do, there are specific gravity less than 2.00, and that's determined to be uh, an inferior product. We separate the materials based on whether they float or don't float, and then based off the differences of the final sample masses of that, it tells us that uh, we can determine a percentage of material that fails to meet that criteria. In this case, you can see a 0.25% here. So if we had something in excess of that, we have a, a, a certain amount of colon lignite beyond what's acceptable.
The other thing we would look at for deleterious materials, of course, would be clay lumps. And clay lumps we're going to test in accordance with the H2T112. And what we're doing is preparing aggregate samples that are allowed to soak overnight or 24 hours in water. At the end of that testing, our soaking cycle, the material is taken out. It's basically tested in hand to see if it degrades, and if, if it does so, then in turn it's determined to be a friable particle. So there will be particles tested at the end after the sample is prepared that will have uh, materials that don't degrade and materials that do degrade. Uh, the difference between those two would help us determine uh, the percentage of clay lumps. In this case, a maximum loss by weight would be 0.25%. So when we start talking about uh, of all the aggregate properties, the source properties, that would summarize pretty well what we're, we need to talk about on that. Now we're going to shift into talking about consensus properties. Uh, Danny Poole from Superior uh, Asphalt Paving will make that next presentation. My name is Danny Poole. I'm with Superior Paving and I'm going to pick up now on the uh, consensus properties. Consensus properties are the test aggregate properties that us asphalt producers test. They include sand equivalency, fine and coarse aggregate angularity, and flat and elongated particles. Typically these properties are run on individual aggregates used for the mix design. However, it is the blended values that govern the results. That allows us, if we have a particular aggregate that may fail on one criteria, to incorporate that into our design because we're looking at the blended aggregates of each one of these properties to see if it passes the minimum requirements. The first step of any successful mix design is to know what material is available to us. Typically, this is a typical stockyard right here. Uh, I'm not quite sure where this photograph was taken, but I know with my experience at the plants I work with, we typically have anywhere between seven and nine virgin aggregates on our yard. So it's very important as us mix designers to know and be successful in doing a mix design the first couple of steps. One, knowing what we have and what all, and to know how to run these properties proficiently, effectively, and also know how they affect our mix during design and during production. Also, knowing what's available to us. You know, if we're dealing with an aggregate that might have a particle shape issue or have a gradation issue or have a clay content issue, uh, we always have that advantage to go talk to our aggregate suppliers to make adjustments and it's happened to me many times in the past where we had to alter a gradation to make a particular design work. Most aggregate producers I've worked with have been very receptive in helping us to adjust gradation bands. So the first consensus aggregate property test that we're going to look at is our clay content, our sand equivalency test. So the sand equivalency test is a measure of clay content based on the sand equivalent value. The sand equivalent value is computed as a ratio of the sand to clay height readings expressed as a percentage. Meaning, once this test has been ran and we do our math calculations, it's going to yield us a value, the sand equivalency value. The greater the value, the better off we are. So if you're getting sand equivalencies in the high 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, I have seen plenty of them in the 80s and 90s, that represents a very good product. It means that the binder is going to adhere to that fine aggregate, ensuring that it's, that, you know, it's being bonded. If the sand equivalency value yields us a low number, we're going to have bonding issues. It probably means there's some clay present and it's going to be difficult for that binder to adhere to our aggregate and it's going to show itself out on the roadway. So typically we obtain our sample and it's measured on material passing the number four sieve. The specifications as you hear it see in this slide on uh, if you're doing an airport job or a federal 
speci specified job specifications will vary depending on their specifications, but on VDOT mixes, other than an SM 9.0A, all VDOT mixes, the minimum requirement is 45%. And that is a blended. If you're using two or three fine aggregates in your mix, and later on in this class, we're going to do this exercise where we're blending our aggregate properties to see if it meets this minimum of 45%. 9.0 mixes, the minimum is 40%. This picture here is the whole, it was all the equipment that is needed in running the sand equivalency test. To the left of that brief, briefcase is a gallon jug and it is mixed. It is a solution that suspends our clay while the sands settle to the bottom of the graduated cylinder that's laying in the bottom of that briefcase. That glass jug is to be a above your countertop by 36 inches and the contents of that glass jug is a calcium chloride mixed with distilled water. They call it a flocculating solution, which, which suspends, again, your clay particles. In this class, you're going to be giving specifications. You're going to be giving handouts of AASHTO specs, VTMs, ASTMs. I urge you to be familiar with them specifications and know how to obtain your samples from the stockyards on all these samples, on how to reduce them to sampling size. So particular on this test, it's probably a reason why we run three of these and we average to three because great care needs to be taken when obtaining your sample to avoid segregation. If you segregate a sample and it's on the coarse side, it's not a lot of fines down there, that could yield us a high sand equivalency. On the other extreme, if you're not careful and you get a sample that's very, very fine, segregated on the fine side, you have a lot of the 100 and 200 material in that sample, could yield you a lower sample equivalency value. To the right, the picture in the slide here to the right is an example of a mechanical shaker. In our specifications, there's three different means the way we can agitate our material once it's introduced into that graduated cylinder. So that's one of the methods there is a mechanical. You have a manual shaker that it operates on a spring. Then you have the old fashioned hand method that you just use your hands left to right. And all three methods have different cycles different in one cycle is one action left to right back and forth is one cycle and uh, please read your specs on there's different cycles depending on which method you choose to use okay so when we introduce our 85 milliliter sample into the graduated cylinder to the four we tap it to to get it wet and we let it stand for 10 minutes then we're going to irrigate our, using our irrigation tube, we're going to irrigate with a stabbing motion all the way to the bottom of this, to this pedestal here, and we're going to flush out all the very, very fine particles of 100, 200 particles. We're going to flush all that out, and we're going to keep doing so until the level, our level reaches to the top of the cylinder where it's marked 15. At that point, we're going to set our timer and we're going to let it set for 20 minutes. At the end of that 20 minutes will be our first reading and it is called the clay reading. And we'll write that down. The red line, there's going to be a distinction between the, our solution. That is the suspended clay right there. And this is our sand matter. After that reading that is obtained, we're going to put in our uh, weighted foot. And when that's introduced, easily into our cylinder at the top of the white marker. We're going to take another reading. We're going to subtract 10 and that will be our sand reading. So when our clay reading and our sand reading is captured, we do the math and it'll yield us our sand equivalency value. It is recommended that we run three of these and average to three. There's just a uh, animation there of what we just discussed. The graduated cylinder has its solution inside. 
Here's where all the heavier, the sand, sand granules settle to the bottom. That is our suspended clay, and there's where we get our readings from. You do have sands. It could be either natural sands. It could be a number 10 from the quarry. It could be a manufactured sands. A lot of the quarries today make manufactured sand, which is a washed tin. It's processed in different ways to manipulate particle shape. So you can run this test on numerous fine aggregates. So some of these fine aggregates have the presence of clay. The minerals are different. You look at these two bullet points here, so you might have one clay mineral, it's more of a lean clay, and you might have another clay mineral, it's more like a clay, like a modeling clay type. But either one of those are present, is gonna yield you lower sandal potency values, which is really gonna give you the, the potential of stripping. I'd like to give you an example, a job I was part of years ago. We were running an E-designated mix, which is limited to 15% wrap. So when you're limited to 15% wrap, you're really feeding a lot of tens into this mix. So we were in production, we got a TSR immediately, the TSR failed, pretty bad. So immediately we ran some sand equivalency tests on it and our value, values yielded a 19. We stopped production immediately. And the reason I tell you this is try to, ex to express how important this test is. So in that TSR pill, it's kind of falling apart in the water bath and we see no sand equivalency values. We stopped production, we got with the quarry, we, they, we got another portion of their tin pile, we tested it, it ran great and we were able to continue the job. And another reason I bring this up, the quarries don't run these tests every day. They don't have the equipment in most of their labs, they have central labs, and it's why I said when we started, when I first started, not only is this important at design time, it's also important during production. We gotta know what our material is and what it's doing. Okay, now our second consensus property, fine aggregate angularity, also known as uncompacted void content of a fine aggregate. It's a measurement of angularity and particle shape. So this test is ran to determine the amount or percentage, as you would, of angular versus rounded particles in a fine aggregate. Super Pave in Virginia, please remember this, this last bullet point right here uses method A. And it's a standard grading, gradation, and it represents the 16, the 30, the 50, and 100 sieve. That's the uh, portion of the fine aggregate we're gonna capture when running this test. And performing this test, you're going to see different results in different types of fine aggregates. You take like a natural sand, for instance, and you run this test, and let's say the minimum on a surface mix in the state of Virginia is 45. That natural sand, I typically, we typically see where I work, it could run 41, 42, 43 percent. A manufactured sand or a number 10 from the quarry, which is quarried material, it's, you know, it's not rounded. That's gonna yield you a higher FAA value. Typically, I, we see 48s, 49s, and 50s. The higher that value is, the value, the, the higher FAA value that you capture represents a more angular product, resulting in a stronger mix. A lower void content FAA content as the 42 and 43 that I spoke of, it, you know, like in a natural sand, represents a more rounded product, the lower the value is, which could, if you use a lot, could uh, lead to uh, some rutting. This picture here depicts the equipment that is used in performing this test. 
The slide to the right is the measured out predetermined weights on the 16, 30, 50, and 100 sieve. It is obtained from a gradation ran in a lab, a wash gradation. When you're emptying your sieves, you want to keep the contents that are retained on the 16, 30, 50, and 100. Then you get your designated weights, and that's the material that you see there in the cup that he's pouring into that mason jar. So you pour the contents into the mason jar, you block off the end of the funnel, and using a square ended spatula, you want to level off the contents inside of this mason jar, then you remove your hand from the bottom of the funnel and you let the contents drop into the uh, calibrated measure. And once the material has fallen through the jar into the measure, you strike it off with that spatula with one sweep. To avoid spilling any material when you're taking it to the scales, you, it's a good idea to tap the side of that measure to, to consolidate some of the material so it doesn't, you don't lose any. Then use a fine brush to brush any uh, material that's collected on this base here. Again, as we said in the uh, Santa Clemency test, depending on what job you're doing, if you're doing a federal job or national job, please pay attention to those specifications as they may differ from VDOTs. So most, uh, all your VDOT mixes is a minimum of 45%. Again, that's on a blended value. And your 9.0 A mixes are the minimum, it's 40%. What effects does the FAA have on performance? FAA in the restricted zone used to limit the amount of rounded natural sands. So I'm going back to the 80s, mid 80s, early 90s, where the specification would limit the amount of a natural sand or rounded product in your surface mixes at 20%. Eventually that spec was done away with. Then the restricted zone was introduced. It was short lived. And when we get further into this class and we're working with different trial blends, we're gonna be talking more about the 45 power chart and there's going to be a diamond shape on the maximum density line that represents the restricted restricted zone from years ago it wasn't recommended to place a asphalt mix on the road with if, when your blend passed it passed through that zone again that zone represents the 1630 1500 so so now that that spec has been written out on the amount of rounded particles you could use. The restricted zone is no longer in play. The FAA takes place to uh, replaces both of those with the 45% minimum on surface mixes as we've seen in the previous slide. Something else that happened in the last couple years was adding a 30 sieve as a spec sieve. Those two criteria coupled together helps us ensure that mixes aren't overloaded with rounded aggregate. So the National Rutting Study was back in 87, performed by NCAT, evaluated a lot of payments in 14 states. The study identified a minimum FA value, FA value of 43.3 to resist rutting. Now we come to the flat and elongated test. Not a favorite of many folks that I know of. I don't really know anybody that thoroughly enjoys running this test, but I'm going to tell you what, it's very, very important, just like the others. This test is run on any coarse aggregate that you may use in any surface, intermediate, or base mix. It's tested on a number four sim material and above. So it could be the four, the three-eighths, half, three-quarter inch. You have to test anything that has more than 10% retained on a particular sieve. And I say that because you got a picture of a Gilson shaker here. So if you have a couple sieves that you might only have 11 or 12% retained on, that might take a lot of time to use an eight inch sieve in your Marianne shaker to ob obtain the weight to perform this test. So some people choose to use a Gilson shaker to speed up that requirement. So 
It's based on the dimensional ratio of particles. Uh, we're looking at maximum to minimum uh, dimension. And the ASTM D4791, which is in your handout, uh, is available to you. And again, for federal work, airport work, uh, they form their uh, specifications on uh, traffic levels. So again, reading our AASHTO specifications and knowing the, how to uh, reduce the sample to testing sizes and after you split it down through your sieves, this picture here represents particles retained on the number four, the three-eighths, the half, and the three-quarter. The, to the left, uh, bottom left of that picture is a uh, F&E measuring device. All right, so from each sieve size, we're going to test each individual aggregate retained on that sieve when we've met our weights. So the upper picture here, we're going to measure the furthest two points in the length of that stone. Then on the bottom part of this caliper, if it passes through these two posts here, it's not desirable, it fails, meaning if the length is greater than three times its thickness, then it fails. Now if you're using a five to one ratio, if its length is greater than five times its thickness, then it fails. So on super paved mixes, super paved mixes, the specification is we're looking at the five to one ratio with a 10% maximum. So in this picture here in the upper left hand corner, the pile that has a greater number of pieces in it, those passed three to one and five to one. To the pile to the right, those particles failed three to one. The bottom picture right here, you can see where it's more extreme, where it's really elongated and flat. It failed five to one. So I got a question. We're talking super pave and the spec is 10% max five to one. Is there any reason to run three to one? I would say yes. You're going, in my opinion, we are going through this practice anyway. I mean, we brought our material in from the yard, we split it down, we counted out, weighed our particles, and we went through the process of doing our five to one. Why not go ahead and keep tabs and keep track on our three to one? And the reason I say that is because if you haven't already, one day may come when, you, when someone gives you a, some specifications on a job that you were just awarded and it calls for SMA. So on SMA, there are specifications on both ratios, five to one and three to one. Five to one being a 5% max, three to one is a 20% max. I strongly urge when you're doing this practice to run both. You start to build that history. Again, you're getting really familiar with the aggregate you have on your yard. It's not that difficult. It only takes a few minutes longer to run your three to one. In fact, if you choose to go this way, test your three to one first. If it passes three to one, it will pass five to one. So it's not like you've got to run each stone from each sieve through both ratios, all of them. So if it passes three to one, it passes five to one. If it fails three to one, you will only measure those particles on the five to one ratio. Sometimes it's better to establish our own history. I think it's all the time better to establish our own history to gain that knowledge, to know it's in our stockyard so we can compare our results with the quarry to see if there's any discrepancies. And if there is, it gives us an opportunity to figure out what's going on and work it out. So again, national specifications, as we talked in the last two tests, if you're presented one of those jobs, please read those specifications. VDOT specs, super pave, as I stated earlier, all mixes shall have less than 10% at five to one. SMA, 
there at the bottom of the slide. Those are the two ratios that are put in the specifications on your SMA. So what effect does F&E have on performance? A lot. If you're working with a product that, exceed, that uh, exceeds the 10% on the five to one, or if you're right there on the border, you know, those particles tend to break under rolling. And uh, it promotes uncoated faces. It could lead to stripping of the asphalt film off the aggregate. Particles tend to reorient under traffic, reducing pavement voids could or may lead to flushing. I think the most important of these three bullet points on this slide is the last one. It's the change in shape that affects mixture volumetrics. I'm going to give you an example. At one of our aggregate suppliers, they make two different types of eights. One eight we use in our everyday super paved dense graded mixes, nine and a half. The other eight that they provide, we use in SMA. So years and years and years ago, I learned the significance that the change in shape has on volumetric. So accidentally, S, the eights that we use in SMA was brought to our plant and we started that day's production with the SMA-8. Our void content, which typically was running about three, eight, four percent, dropped down to two. I can't even begin to tell you how much it affects the volumetrics as a particle shape in the F and E. It's a big deal. So I think that is probably the most important bullet point there. Coarse aggregate angularity. It's a test I normally don't run where I work. All the aggregates we work with are quarried. They're blasted from the earth. So therefore, everything is 100% fractured. It's all kind of faces on it. If you're working in a part of the state that has gravel pits, if you're getting stone from gravel pits or river stone, this is where this test is important. Again, it's measured on the uh, material retained on the floor sieve and above, similar to the F&E. And you want to test the sieve sizes that has greater than 10% retained. And it's based on the percent of fractured faces. What constitutes a fractured face? When you're picking up each individual aggregate, if, if the ratio is greater than 25% of that surface area, it's considered to be a fractured face. Again, some of your federal work, the specifications vary, and they base that on pavement surface traffic level. Here's a good picture uh, that explains this here is no fractured faces, and you will come across some that are questionable, gone up in the air. This is one or more fractured faces. It's another, some specification, VDOT specification has one fractured face requirements and two fractured face requirements. That's why that picture on the upper left hand corner is there, it kind of shows that. So we talked about the fine aggregate angularity and the coarse aggregate angularity, limiting rounded products from our mixes. So here's a good illustration. What, if we didn't have these things in place, the bottom picture, you could see that cross-cut view there of a lot of particles are rounded. The top picture cross-section view is of a more angular product with the limited amount of rounded particles. So what happens under, uh, under traffic? If we uh, put a lot of those rounded particles in our mixes, that's what could happen right there under traffic. The pavement will move and tend to rut. So as I noted a couple times during the uh, going over these tests, all consensus properties are specified on the blended material. You can have an individual aggregate can fail one of the criteria as long as the blend passes. In addition to the consensus properties, the mix designer must also measure the specific gravity of the aggregates used. 
Now this is not, there's, there's no pass or fail or spec that you're going to find in section 211. It is what it is. It's the deposit, it's the mineral, it's the rock in the ground. The gravity is going to be what the gravity is going to be. So what is a gravity? Specific gravity is the ratio of the mass of a given volume of aggregate to the mass of an equal volume of water at the same temperature. So what's that mean? Think about it for a minute. Pre assume that the gravity of water is one. And you run a gravity on, let's say, a number 78 material. And you, that test gives you a value of 2.910, meaning that that aggregate is 2.910 times heavier than water. Think back when you're working at the plant, you're sitting in here today because you are plant one, plant two certified. So you're actually running gravities every day during production. You're running gravities, but a GMM, your rice, that's a gravity. When you make your specimens in a gyratory compactor, that's a bulk mix gravity, your GMB, you're performing a gravity. Anytime you immerse something in water and weigh it and compare it to the weight in air, usually constitutes you're doing a gravity test. Now this picture here depicts three different gravities that we're measuring. The three R, the GSA, if you read that backwards, it's a parent specific gravity. The other one is a GSE, which is the effective specific gravity. And the last one is a GSB, the bulk specific gravity. So you may be wondering why I mentioned the GSA, the apparent specific gravity. That gravity is not used in any calculation on any asphalt mix design that we're working on. But we're going to run it. It's a practice we like to use and run anyway. It's just a simple, I mean, you've gone through the motions of collecting the material, breaking it down, washing it, sieving it over a four sieve, doing your 15 to 19 hour soak, all this stuff. It's a simple calculation to calculate your GSA and we're going to do it for a reason. So when you look at those three gravities, let's start at the heaviest one. The GSA, the apparent specific gravity is the solid volume only. When we run a gravity test, it doesn't matter whether it's coarse or refined specific gravity. There are pores, crevices that is not visible to the naked eye that's going to absorb water. Typically, a lot of the aggregates I work with have an absorption rate anywhere from like 0.4 to 1.1. That's the water that, it's going, that stone is going to absorb. Again, you can't see it with the naked eye. So the GSA is measuring the solid volume of that stone only. Not any, there's no absorption involved. No absorption therefore yielding us the highest value. Now your GSB, your bulk specific gravity, is the solid volume of that aggregate plus all the, all the pores that are filled with water. It's taken into account of all the water that that aggregate is going to absorb. So you know going in your aggregate is heavier in water, that GSB is going to yield us the lowest value because it's taken on water with a gravity of one, therefore making it the lowest value of the two. Now the GSE, the effective specific gravity, that is the only gravity that is not immersed in water. Again, when you run a GMM, you run a GMB, when you do your GSB and GSA, you're immersing those in water. Your GSE, you are not immersing in water. It's a mathematical calculation. It's done at the time of design, and it's done on every volumetric sample that you run during production. It's calculated off a of percent binder, percent stone. Your GMM, 
and your binder gravity. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So the GSC, the reason the GSC should fall between the GSA and the GSB on the numerical value. Now the GSE predicts the amount of binder that aggregate is going to absorb. Now water is going to penetrate further into that aggregate than binder will. So remember that the GSE recognizes the difference between asphalt and water permeable pores. So when you're doing the design, again, another reason you run your GSA and your GSB, your GSE is always going to fall in the middle. If it falls outside, if it's heavier than the GSA or if it's lighter than the GSB, rest assured a mistake was made. This illustration here is somewhat outdated and sometimes hard to decipher exactly what it means. I feel that there's a better picture graphic that explains GSE, GSA, and GSB in your mixed design study guide in chapter three. Okay, now we're gonna walk through a couple of our gravity tests. The course aggregate specific gravity is measured on all course aggregates. The aggregate fraction of that sample, everything retained on the number four sieve and above. So once you bring your material into the lab, you reduce it to specifications to the sampling size. You want to wash that sample. You want to dry it to a constant mass. Then once it's dried, you want to soak in a water bath for 15 or in a pan for 15 to 19 hours. After it's soaked for that amount of time, you want to determine the sur saturated surface drive. That is the weight you will, re will record. Then once that weight is recorded immediately, you want to put it into your water bath and capture a underwater weight. After that weight is captured, you're going to dry to a constant weight. You're going to cool at room temperature and you'll weigh the contents. It is always recommended to run at least two of these tests and average the two samples. Fine aggregate specific gravity. Again, you're bringing your material into the lab and this time we're going to test the fraction of the sample that passes the number four sieve. Unlike the coarse aggregate, we will not wash this product. We're going to run as is, whether it's a tin, a manufactured sand, or a natural sand, but we do want to dry it out first. And the reason you might be thinking, well, if we're not washing it, can we introduce water to it immediately? Not so fast. You want to dry it out. It gives you a better, it gives you a more accurate absorption value. So you're going to soak it, after you dry it, you're going to soak it again for 15 to 19 hours using some warm, warm air, not an oven. Uh, you want to slowly dry to achieve your SSD weight. Once you had achieved your SSD weight, you need to capture 500 grams plus or minus 10. You want to place those contents in a pygnometer with water and agitate until all air is removed. Weigh and transfer to a pan and dry. Here's some testing apparatus that you will need to run a fine aggregate specific gravity. Your pygnometer, your uh, cone and tamping rod. So we're going to de determine our SSD, our surface saturated dry based on the cone slump. So when you're getting close, fill the contents of that cone in one motion, applying 25 drops of your weighted tamper, 25 drops at five millimeters at each drop. The slide to the right, the picture to the right represents, it's a good picture of uh, achieving SSD. Now you will have aggregate that may have a higher FAA value 
which represent it's going to be more angular. Or you could have a fine aggregate that has a very high 200 content. In those aggregates, you may not get the same result on those aggregates as you see in this picture here. It is said to consider when removing that cone on those type aggregates, if you have one side that collapses, then it's SSD. So what happens, why, and you want some repeatability. You want some repeatability and you want to be consistent on every aggregate that you test. So what happens if we miscalculate our SSD? What if our material is too wet? It's going to yield us a lower GSB. What if we overextend this, you walk away from your sample, the phone rings, or someone's talking to you and the material gets too dry, it's going to inflate your GSB value. There are provisional methods in the, in the specification that alternative cone tests that I suggest you read if you're dealing with an aggr a fine aggregate that uh, has a very high FAA value or a high 200 content. So after we determined our SSD, as I mentioned a minute ago, we want to enter that 500 plus or minus 10 grams into our pignometer that already is about three quarters full of our specified temperature of water. We want to introduce this material in this flask with the water three quarters away full to eliminate the effort in removing air. If you put your aggregate in there first and introduce your water, you're going to have a tougher time agitating and get rid of all the air presence. So why do we care about bulk specific gravity? Why does it matter? We need to calculate VMA during design and production. That's why great care has to be taken in running these coarse and fine aggregate gravities. During production, it's so important that these values are right because it's going to kind of guide you in production of where your VMA is going to ride. Does everyone remember what VMA is? I'll give you a couple examples. If you've got mixture, a surface mix perhaps, and you compacted a specimen, and you can, re you can remove all the binder from that specimen that represents VMA. VMA represents the space that is available to accommodate the effective binder content and air voids necessary in that mix. I want to back up for a moment another thing about VMA. You know, we talked about the F and E and the particle shape on the F and E. We talked about fine aggregate angularity. We didn't talk much about gradation. We will as the class goes on, as you will see in your three trial blends that we work on this week, they all drive VMA. Gradation, particle shape, and gravity. VMA is important because it ensures good stability and durability. So what happens if you don't have enough VMA, if your VMA is running on the low side? If your minimum is a 15 and you're running a 14.6 all the time, or a 14.8 or a 15.1, there's no room for binder. It's low durability, results in a thin film thickness. What if your VMA is too high? Is there such a thing as too high of a VMA? Let's say you're running a, your minimums of 15 and you're up there at 18 and a half. Some may try to overcompensate and fill that, try to fill that space up with a binder leading to an unstable mix. So the VMA is one volumetric property in the design. You also have VFA, VTM voids and total mix. And volumetrics analysis is a, is a way of evaluating the relationships between mass, meaning weight, and volume. When your volume changes, your volumetric properties change. 
So when we're doing a mix design, we test and measure the GSB, which is your bulk specific gravity for every aggregate. Let's say you're doing a mix design, it has five virgin aggregates in it. We ran our individual GSBs on all those aggregates, fine and coarse. Now we're going to blend them, which we will do later. And as you can see at the top bullet point here, those five blended aggregates yields us a 2.663 blended GSB. Remember earlier when I spoke about the GSE, it's the only gravity that's not immersed in water? It's a calculation. Well, when we calculated our GSE, we came up with a 2.678. Doing a mix design, it is so important that these values be correct, accurate, and it all hinges on our consensus properties and doing those tests properly. So now we need to determine our field correction factor. So what is a field correction factor? What we're going to do is we're going to subtract the GSB, our blended GSB, from our GSE and the difference is going to be a 0 0.015. So where will that zero, that 0 0.015 come in effect? Once we get into production, as I said earlier, every time you run a volumetric property test during production, your GSE is calculated. So you're going to subtract the field correction factor from your GSE. It's calculated in a lab to give you a GSB. It's impossible to run a GSBs on every stockpile during production to calculate VMA. So when your GSC is determined during your uh, production sample, you subtract the correction factor, gives us uh, GSB to calculate our uh, VMA. So your example here during, you know, during production, you run a sample, you get a 2.671, you subtract a 0.015, your GSB is a 2.656 that will calculate your VMA. Here's a, I mentioned earlier in this presentation of the, uh, the information we need to calculate our GSE, 100% minus PB, which is percent binder. And you also will need your rice and your binder specific gravity. Those are the components you know, need to calculate your GSE. Also remember when you're doing a mix design, we talked about the blended GSB for all our component aggregate in a mix design. The GSE is used to estimate the GSB of your wrap proportion of your mix design. So when you collect your aggregate to do a mix design, when you bring your wrap into the lab, this will be discussed in length further in this class, but you've got to determine the binder content of your wrap through four asphalt NCAT burns in your furnace, two GMMs, there's the information you need that's required to work that formula, and that's the uh, GSE that you will use on your wrap when you blend your, all your aggregates together. So, in summary, we are very fortunate to work with the aggregate we have here in Virginia. We're really blessed with some good aggregates. Volumetric control of asphalt mixes will re require consistent gradations and aggregate shape. You know, when I first started talking in this presentation, you know, getting to know what's in your stockpile, that just doesn't account for December when we're collecting aggregate to do mix designs. We can't always depend on our aggregate producers to supply us with all their results. We got to know, we really got to know our aggregate. So during, during your production months, you can run any of these tests, build a history. Flatten elongated particles is your greatest potential for a problem, a mixed volumetric problem. Thank you.